Hey everybody, Brian Von Vier here, back at it again with something a little bit darker. What is the most horrific example of metagaming that you have ever experienced while playing D&D Part 2? When I was running an adventure and a player said, That's not the way this module is supposed to be. Because I knew it was a classic adventure and I had completely rearranged the maps and changed the creatures. I was using the basic story, but had changed the solution. He heard the intro and he expected the exact original module, which he had memorized. Sorry, but I don't ever run a module directly by the book, and you shouldn't so you can throw actual surprises at the players. We were in a tough fight against a large foe. Everyone was fighting effectively, using the last of our resources, and barely standing. Keep putting damage into the creature, but it wasn't going down, and most of us weren't sure we were going to make it. Someone dropped and a player couldn't decide whether to spend his action healing or attacking. Another player looked at the DM's paper and said, Don't worry, it only had six hit points left. Turned an on-the-edge combat into a complete letdown. We chewed the player out for the next few sessions. Why don't you just boot him out? I mean, that's probably a better idea at this point. I have an example of a horrific debate about metagaming based on one of the more egregious discussions I've ever had. The party was planning an assault on the castle of a fearsome vampire. The blood hunter had some stratagem in mind. Not really important what, of course, but we were concerned it wouldn't work if the vampire was able to charm him. In character, slightly poorly expressed, the blood hunter said, Why not switch me with the paladin? Her charisma save is crazy. Attempting to be in character, wizard, I replied, Strength of character will not be of help. It is strength of will that is required. They all got the translation. It's a wisdom save, ninny. At this point, the DM called timeout. None of you have ever faced a vampire before. That is shameless metagaming and I strike it from the record. There is no way your characters could know that. The blood hunter responds, I'm a monster hunter who has dedicated his life to the destruction of undead in all their forms and has a particular interest in vampires. Nope. Paladin. I am a doom guide paladin and I too am devoted to the destruction of the undead. Also, I used to be a priest of Kalimavor. Nope. Wizard. I am a necromancer with the sage background. I haven't made an academic study of the undead. Nope. Party. Eh, maybe we could roll to see what we know. DM, nope. Party. Ah, sake. Okay, this actually kind of sounds like a DM just being up his own ass. Really, for for real. Like, if this is a, if th this DM is so bad at actually doing their job because they're, they don't want to ruin an encounter or something, yeah, no, bye. Get him out. Was once playing an evil campaign with a UA Oath of Treachery Paladin and was murdered out of the blue by a bolt of slaying and then a lot of stabbing from two of the other party members. <laughs> okay. When asked why, they said, Well, he was bound by oath to betray us eventually, so we thought we'd kill him first. Okay, bear in mind, I'd never brought up my oath by name or voiced any obligation to betray any allies and character, nor did I interpret the oath that way. It was literally only because they saw the title of my character's oath on my character sheet that they'd come to this conclusion. To add offense to injury, this was the start of the session where I'd travel an hour and a half to get to the DM's house and didn't have a spare sheet prepared. So I just had to watch for like an hour while rolling up a new character. Also, I'm surprised that they actually were allowed to play at that table. Hope you found another one. I had players who would metagame so hard that if they heard tale of a monster coming up in the game, like if I telegraphed that they were going to be fighting something they'd never heard of before, by next game, they were experts on that specific monster. Eventually, I started pulling monsters that weren't in the books, but from folklore, and used the equivalent from the books just so they couldn't be like, okay, it uses this rule and has this power and can do this to us, without any actual in-game research. There was the time where they figured out that they were going up against trolls, which none of the characters knew about. But the players started talking about how they were going to stock up on fire and acid weapons, then, when they show up, it's trolls from Norse mythology. And they didn't give two shits about their fire or acid. It was sunlight that killed them. Kind of put an end to their metagaming and made them actually do in-game research to figure things out. Now, they couldn't rely on reading ahead. 
by the end of the campaign, I had an entire bestiary written for custom monsters. This is kind of the way to handle that situation, and I'm really proud of you. Oh, I got one for ya. 3.5. DM tells us all to make strong characters for the challenging homebrew campaign he made. Fair dues. Made sure to check with him about source books and ask if anything is banned, because let's face it, 3.5 can get really insane. Double check this by telling him I plan on using the Warblade class. Well, if you know, you know. He gives me the green light, and we begin. We start at level 5, and I end up standing alone facing an entire pack of werewolves by myself since the rest of the party got dunked. As a Warblade, I was able to keep myself alive a, a bit, but after killing two werewolves in the middle of combat, DM says that the other werewolves cannot be killed by anything that isn't a silver weapon. I ask why I was able to kill the other ones, and he says, they weren't fully turned yet. Okay, that's actually fair enough. I end up going down. We end up having another session after this where everyone made new characters at the same level again. I make a Warblade. But this time I do a bit better of a job by making him a tiny bit stronger. But I didn't grab any silver weapons or anything because I didn't want to metagame. Well, the DM sees my new Warblade, leaves for a bit, and then comes back to start the session. Again, everyone is dead and I'm fighting a homebrew creature that just cannot die. I was able to deal well over 100 damage, but nothing killed this thing. Finally, after being the last one left alive and dying again, I ask why I couldn't kill the creature, and the DM says, because you keep using homebrew shit like Warblade. Now keep in mind, Warblade is in homebrew in 3.5. I essentially got called a cheater, and I just never played with that DM again. Still to this day, I've never seen someone metagame against a player that quickly. I guessed he was interested in TPKs and my Warblade was getting in the way of that. Ugh. I hate DMs like that. Just the, 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 the players are not your enemy. They're there to enjoy a beautiful story. Our Paladin was notorious for metagaming, to the point where the DM made a separate voice chat to take players into when they weren't anywhere near his. The most obvious example was when he was actively trying to somehow uh, help another player, despite the fact that he could in no way see or hear anything that was going on considering the room was magically locked and had a spell that basically muffled or muted all sound anyone on the other side of the door might be able to hear under normal circumstances. He was getting increasingly impatient during the times when others were in the private VC and would immediately ask what had happened or been said. He also tried to declare what my character should do while I attempted to break an NPC out of prison and claimed it was advice when I told him no and he said I would like agency of my own character. He was one of those main character types who thought he was basically just running a team like some sort of tactical simulator as he also made plans with entire scripts to follow and even went so far as to try and declare what my character's summoned bodyguards would be up to during a siege until the DM reminded him that they were specifically bound to me and would only follow my commands, so he needed consent from me to have them in that location. I think I ended up agreeing to let him have one of them for that part of the strategy, but not both. And at some point, I telepathically called them both back to me, so they left where they were to return to my side. He was not the most fun player to deal with. The worst thing in D&D is when people want to win the game rather than experience the world. Oh, I had a lot of those people from Mr. Ripper come up to me and say, I like winning the game. Back when it was my first time DMing, I wanted to see a proper story play out since I was unsure how my style played off. So I bought Curse of Strahd. Oh, have fun with that. Everyone played fairly normal and sensibly except the Ranger. He would never react in character to the horrors of Barovia, and eventually was the target of one of the illusions. He saw a body in the street, and when he approached it, he saw his own body looking up at him. He played this off as, Uh, I'm used to this by now. While it was the first interaction with the illusion magics of Barovia. I didn't think too much about it, but near the end of the campaign, I started noticing it more. He demanded that the wizard cast magic weapon on his bow so he could deal the most damage as the majority of the creatures were unaffected or resistant to his non-magical attacks. Once again, didn't care. But when we reached a long lost temple that had amazing gifts at a cost, he seemed very interested. The session had to end a bit early, so we picked it up there afterwards. Come the following week, he went from interested in the buffs to completely wanting to avoid it. After they left, I mentioned he seemed interested in the gift of the flight last week and was surprised he didn't take it. He then said, 
oh yeah, it would have been cool, but I didn't want to deal with X. X was the uh, consequence that he wasn't supposed to know about from taking the gift. At that point, I went from following the story as close as possible to purposefully making changes on the spot. He finally caught on when he found the room, which he could have received a wish spell, and was surprised that it wasn't there. He asked why it wasn't, and I simply asked him how did he know it should have been there. To say the least, if I do play another module with this particular group again, it'll be changed up significantly. Good, that's how it's meant to be played. Get the players a little bit interested with some intrigue and surprise, and don't let a metagamer ever win. Two of my players, but mainly just the one. We have to play online due to COVID, so we have character sheets on D&D Beyond. So early on in our current campaign, they end up finding a hag's hut and getting some loot. Most is cursed seven ways to Sunday, of course. A few pieces were useful, some cursed with a useful property. Finally, some could have curses removed to be beneficial. So I had to homebrew two rings, fire resistance and poison resistance, because they were cursed to grant vulnerability instead of resistance. I tell them to add the homebrew rings, not the standard ones. Descriptions match the standard rings, but the built-in conditions are set to vulnerabilities. They go to a city nearby with a mid-level mage who identifies most of the items but is not powerful enough to see the curses. My one player, after attuning to his ring, questions why his character sheet says he's vulnerable to poison damage. I said, well, I'm not sure. He asks if it's the ring, and I say, nothing. The other player, whom I am now having more problems with, says his ring is also granting vulnerability to fire damage. He asks, are these cursed items? I said, well, I don't know. No DM is going to tell their players they have cursed items if they aren't supposed to know. So this guy says, I cast remove curse on these two rings. I flat out say, no you don't. You don't have any reason to suspect anything is wrong with these rings, he said. I'm going to tell the other player to do fire damage to me. Again, I'm just thinking why. The player, well, says, I, I don't think that is fair that if we go into combat and we're hit with the damage we're vulnerable to, we won't know and we take more damage than necessary. This literally blew my mind as he's DM'd a prior edition of D&D for more than a decade. I said, you do realize that curses are supposed to be detrimental to the wearer, right? But nevertheless, once you attune to them, they turn to dust. I absolutely had it at this point. This player questions why I said that, and he wants the fire resistance. I was dumbfounded. There is a silver lining. I'm using these two minor curses as a learning experience. Now I won't build in detrimental properties into D&D Beyond and just make it surprise sessions later so my players will have no idea where the detrimental property came from. Yeah, we don't want anyone to get the surprise right away and especially if they're headhunting for the actual surprise. Hey everybody, Brian Von Vier here back at it again. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and of course to ring that bell so you get notified when we post a brand new video. And if you have an instance of metagaming you'd like to share, please do so in the comments below. All the love, be safe, we'll see you next time.